Ben Trey. I have a Master's of Fine Arts from the Rhode Island School of Design, and I reside in Providence. My studio is in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, which is just the next town over. I've been working as an artist since 19, well, I'd say 1979. Graduated uh, from RISD in 1980, but started working with glass in 1975. Most of my work utilizes uh, cast glass, a process that I adapted from working with bronze. A lot of my work has been involved in the public realm, so I have designed plazas for Target's headquarters in Minneapolis, Bank of America in Charlotte, uh, redesigned an entire town center in England where I not only do the paving, but I also create the seating, the soft landscape, the hard landscape, fountains, sculptures, etc. So this is my most recent group of work. Uh, they're called The Lightness of Being. And uh, I think after 10 years of doing major projects in a bunch of different parts of the world, I wanted to do something that didn't have a very big footprint because I had been having a pretty big footprint and I wanted to do something that was a bit smaller in scale and, and uh, conceived basically totally in the studio without uh, a, a site because a lot of the last 12 or 15 years the work has been site oriented. But my work from the beginning was focused on ritual architectural elements as the expression of ritual and creating sculptures on different scales as are in the exhibition um, that embody that interest of mine. I mean as an artist grows their interests change but their focus is sort of somehow always you know it's their work even though they may shift the way it's expressed, it's still there. So in this exhibition, you can see that there's figurative elements, there's feet, there's waists, there's heads, there's architectural elements, there's stupas, there's fluted columns. Um, and really that didn't, that just morphed in terms of another way of expressing my interests. So my process at this point, having worked for 35 years, is I draw. I have sketchbooks and I have a huge drawing board. Two of the working drawings are in the show, as well as the works on paper, not to confuse them. And so I draw. I start out with either something I've seen or been with or traveled and seen. I've traveled a lot of places in the world, seen something architecturally seen a handmade object in a museum in Indonesia or in Scotland, in Edinburgh, a natural history museum. And then I'll come back and you don't always see it right away. It might take a couple of years, but all of a sudden I'll start drawing and, and I'll base the images on, you know, what I've interpreted. So I don't, I don't really appropriate uh, which some artists do. They appropriate other cultures' work. I try to get an essence of what it is that's in there that touches me, and then I work on that. And, and I draw first in sketchbooks, then I draw full scale, which are the working drawings. Then I have a team of people in my studio now, didn't used to, I do now, who turn those drawings into 
um, polystyrene styrofoam, but not white styrofoam, a very dense foam shape. I go in, I make changes to it. Then um, they're cast in sand, and then the sand is taken to glass factories, industrial factories, and they're cast in glass. So that's sort of the process of it. It's, it's like the opposite end of what people think of as glass. It's very industrial. I don't have any furnaces in my studio. I use industrial factories. Um, and you know, then the glass comes back and we work on it and finish it and I change more things. And we add, in this case, there's a lot of bronze that's, that are connected to the pieces. Um, and the bronze is cast at another at a bronze foundry and we bring that in and we incorporate it with the glass, and color it, patina it. The glass is very different than bronze. Bronze is very, very liquid. I mean, it gets hot to a certain temperature and it's like water. And then five degrees later, it's a solid. Glass is called a supercooled liquid. It's just sort of more like honey. So if you were to heat honey up, it would get runnier, viscous. If you, as it cooled down, it would start to stiffen up. So when we, when we cast the glass, it might take three hours to cast one casting, but it's kind of thick. So as it drops down into the mold, things are gonna happen. It's uh, in sand molds, which have an organic binder, so there's carbon in there. The carbon might be released. And so you'll see in some of the pieces there are these sort of smudgy areas because the carbon's, some of it's floated up to the top and then the glass got cold and it couldn't get out. And that's what happens with the bubbles. The bubbles start and as you can see, they start to float. But slowly the glass is solidifying. So they get trapped. Now I could say that in the beginning, I had no idea 35 years ago, but I have a pretty good idea now what is going to happen. And I think in this group of work, partially called, you know, because it was called the lightness of being, the bubbles kind of give you that feeling like you're just floating and you're moving upward. And, um, you know, they have that. And of course, they also give you the idea of, of the sea and, and bubbles being trapped. It's almost like a a frozen liquid. So, but I, I, I have to be quite honest, I couldn't tell you what exactly it was gonna go there, it might go there, it might go there. But, uh, but I have a pretty good idea that it's gonna be in there. And, and, uh, and because of the way we cast, they ascend. If you were gonna cast things horizontally, then they'd always be on one side. But this way they're always, I know they're coming up. So that's why they look like they're floating towards the top. The way I use the glass is it's solid. And what I realized very early on when I first started making my first cast glass pieces, which were rather small, big for people working with cast glass in back then, but rather small, is that the density of the glass absorbs the light. So when you come to this exhibition, you'll see how the glass glows. That allowed me to create forms which might be masculine, but with the light in them, it allowed them to, to gain this feminine side to them. They kind of glow. I mean, a lot of my work over the years has that duality in, in, in it. it. It has a masculine, component and a feminine component. Sometimes it's by form, sometimes it's by the, how the way the glass glows. So I got interested in uh, that idea of casting the glass partially because I could create forms which were very strong and powerful, but had this lightness to them because the glass brought in the light. Then over the years, I mean, very early on, I started adding copper to my work patinaing it, lead, bronze, stone. I work a lot with various kinds of granite. 
um, especially in the big outdoor projects. And you can use granite the way a painter uses paint. You change the palette of the granite depending upon the finish you put on it. So if you took this travertine floor that we're sitting on and you sandblasted it, it would look completely different. If you honed it, it would look different. If you chiseled it, it would look different. So when I use different materials, I work with them and then I, you know, it's a way of adding color and density to the sculptures that, you know, aren't decorative per se, but somehow are integrated into the sculptures. You know, I'm, I'm really kind of an old school kind of <laughs> artist, and I think a lot of museums now have moved to so much didactic material that people who come to museums will stand and read more than they'll look at the painting or the sculpture, or they've got those headsets on, or now it's on their iPhone. And so you go into this, you know, the Met or any museum, and all you hear are all this blah, blah, bleeding out from these headsets. And, and then people are not really looking, they're listening. And then they stand there for a designated amount of time and then they move to the next one. I want people to look. They don't need any didactic saying, you just come, experience it. After you've experienced it, there are books. You can go read about it if you really want to become more involved. So that's why there's no didactic material because I, I've done my work. I've created all these things. Now it's your turn. You do some work. Don't read, look at it, think about it. Come up with what you think about it and then go read. With these pieces, you want a field of sculpture. You're gonna walk in there and you're gonna be in a forest and you're gonna walk around and you're gonna to start to identify well, that one, oh yeah, but look at that, oh, that one. Oh, I see the connection between that one. So, I mean, I've had, I don't know how many museum shows, but at least 25 gallery exhibitions. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I have a pretty good idea of how to install. So, you know, you look at the space, and this is just a cube. Um, so how do you activate the cube? You know, people are gonna come in from the entrance, you want them to see something right away that draws them into the room. So you put a certain kind of piece there. Then you put another piece, the bigger one here. Now they're intrigued, so they turn that corner and all of a sudden there's a field. But you want them to go to the back corner. So maybe you put the tallest piece there. On the other side you put a work on paper because you've got to draw them in. You've got to get them in. The now once they're in the room, the rest is, then they'll experience it how they want. Same thing here, we have this long corridor. How are we gonna get people to go all the way down there? Well, we're gonna put a piece down there. We're gonna put the, another small piece down there because the ceiling's low. Gonna draw them down, put some work, you know. It's, it's, again, it's just something I experience the space. In a way, it's kind of different than the way some architects or landscape architects work, they are looking in plan all the time. They're looking in a plan view of the space. I am a sculptor. I try to feel what the space feels like and how are people gonna experience it. You know, one of the things I've, I, I, I think about my work is that it, it's sort of archetypal. It reaches out to a kind of universal commonality and tries to bring that into an, an object, into a sculpture. So when people come to see it, they're not exactly sure what it is, especially if they're not educated in art, but they know there's something in there that touches them. And that's because there is a universal nature of who we are. It's just expressed differently in different cultures. And not to be too pretentious, but I always feel like that's what I'm sort of trying to, to touch. What is it in those sculptures or architecture that, that somehow connect us all.